Okay, great. We're right, going to get started today. I'm Emily Zwacki, and this webinar, we're going to be talking about some of the more fun applications of topography and LIDAR, talking about applications related to 3D printing and iPhone LIDAR. So this is the last webinar as part of our spring webinar series, but you can find recordings of all of the previous webinars on our YouTube channel at Open Topography. And after today, you'll also be able to find the video recording of this webinar there as well. If you haven't joined for one of our prior webinars, just a reminder of some of the logistics. This is set up so that only the presenters and moderators will speak. If you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A option. Some of these questions we may answer as we go along with uh, by the other Open Topography team members, but then at the end of the webinar, we'll also have a live Q&A discussion section. So just a little bit of an outline of what we're going to cover today. So half is related to 3D printing. So we're going to talk about kind of the basics of generating 3D prints from topography, some of the types of 3D printing and kind of differences, and then ap educational applications of 3D prints. Then we're going to go and talk about iPhone LiDAR. So giving a little bit of an overview of that talking about how to use iPhone LiDAR, and then also some of the applications and potential limitations of the iPhone LiDAR. So starting off with 3D printing. So why talk about 3D printing and, you know, kind of what is 3D printing? So these 3D prints, these are solid three-dimensional physical objects that are created from a digital file. Over time, 3D printing technologies have become increasingly common. It's very popular and it's also become lower in cost. And so we can harness these 3D printing technologies for a variety of applications, including, you know, things related to geology and education, uh, in addition to just kind of the fun hobbyist things that, you know, 3D prints are kind of cool in and of themselves. So what we can do is use LiDAR topography um, and other types of, you know, uh, UAV or satellite-based topography to create 3D prints. So this is an awesome three-dimensional tactile way to hold geologic features in your hand. So you can see here, this is a depiction of the LiDAR point cloud of a sunset crater, a volcano up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and obviously our LiDAR point cloud is a 3D rep representation of the topography and the land surface. So that essentially holds all the information that we need to create a 3D print of that. And so this is a kind of just a digital virtual representation of a 3D model. And obviously we have kind of the surface level in our point cloud. So in creating a 3D print, what we need to do is kind of fill in the structure and put in a base. But otherwise, we have all this information that we can look at and explore in a tactile way. So it's a pretty simple workflow to go from topography to an actual physical 3D print of it. So you start off with a digital elevation model. So this is a two and a half D raster uh, that can be created from a LiDAR point cloud. From that, you go through a workflow and create a digital file of that. This is typically a file that is an STL file, a standard triangle, triangular language file. I believe that's the acronym. Um, and that's what is most commonly used in 3D printing. And then you can take that STL file and turn that into essentially a cut file with all these specific layers that your 3D printer is then going to print. And you can go from, you know, getting your digital elevation model to something you can physically uh, hold. So where would you go to get topography data for 3D printing? Well, open topography is a great repository for high resolution topography data. So this map shows all the high resolution topographic data sets. Everything that is in red is completely open access. These are data sets hosted on open topography. So lots um, in California, the whole state of Indiana, and also lots in New Zealand. 
Um, what's shown in green is USGS 3D elevation program or 3D data. And then the blue is showing NOAA data, mainly along the coasts. Um, those two data sets are currently restricted to academics, but we're looking to open up a subscription-based model um, where everyone can access them. But in addition to this high-resolution data, we also host a regional and global topographic data, um, just for example, USGS 10 meter, uh, SRTM, uh, ALOS. So depending on wherever in the world you kind of want to grab topography data for it to make a 3D print, you can get that on open topography. Um, so in some of our previous webinars, we kind of talked a little bit uh, about more of the full workflow of uh, getting and creating digital elevation models from open topography. Um, so you can navigate to the area of interest and select the region that you'd like to create a digital elevation model. For this, I have selected Meteor Crater. Um, and that's going to download your DEM. Now, in addition to getting topography data from uh, open topography, there's also a website called Touch Terrain, where you can uh, select an area you, you want, and then it will create that STL file that you need. Um, although the highest resolution available on there is 10 meters, but we are looking to integrate the functionalities of touch terrain into open topography, where hopefully in the future, um, you can select the, your area and put in all the information needed to create your 3D printable file. But if you've gotten your digital elevation model um, from open topography or elsewhere online, uh, you can use the free GIS software QGIS and a plugin that's called DEM to 3D, and that is what's going to create your file for 3D printing. So essentially, you have your kind of digital elevation model, and from that, you can select specifically the area that you'd like to have 3D printed. And the kind of key things to think about is how big do you want your model to be? What are the dimensions? With 3D printing, there's typically a pretty specific base plate area that is how big your print can be. Um, but what you can also do is you can divide your model. So essentially kind of split this up into many different squares or rectangles, which you could put together as a puzzle where you could have something really big. With this, you can also change the vertical exaggeration. So oftentimes, unless it's very steep topography, I might increase the exaggeration to 1.5 time since that ends up looking pretty good in your 3D print. Um, and then the other control is kind of adding the, the height here is uh, going to be your lowest point here. And then it allows you to add a base height. So this is kind of had this has a little bit of a base height to it so that there's something else kind of on the bottom. Um, and then this kind of creates everything for you as you export it to an STL file. And on our YouTube, and uh, we also have a whole page on our website that has a full step-by-step -step tutorial for how to use QGIS and this plugin and some other tips and tricks in the process for creating a 3D printable model. Um, it's recommended that you don't use the very newest version of QGIS, but rather kind of what is the most recent stable version of that. But as you can see here, um, well, let me go back quickly. You can, I have right here in my hands uh, what's shown on here, the kind of end result. But in addition to that workflow, we do also have a Jupyter notebook that's called LIDAR Point Cloud to STL. So this is going through the steps of a, a different manner of how to convert a LIDAR point cloud into an STL file, which you can use in kind of virtual environments. And again, that STL is the main file type that's used for 3D printing. So with a pretty simple workflow, you have your generated digital file. So obviously you can see there's a lot of detail that's in the digital file, but depending on the method of 3D printing that's used, um, kind of depends on exactly how much detail you can capture. But some other cool things you can do with kind of the digital file in preparation for 3D printing, uh, using free software uh, that's easy to download, you can add text right onto your um, 
file that's going to be 3D printed. So this is really cool. So this is an example of Dragon's Back Ridge in California. This is along the San Andreas Fault. So this is a nice way to even just have a direct reminder of exactly what the location is that's 3D printed. And as well, we can, you know, include that this came from open topography on it. And so in addition to just adding simple things like text, there's also things that you could do, like you could um, in perhaps environments where there's lots of different sedimentary layers, you could even split your file into different layers and have that printed in different colors. Um, so you can kind of have uh, depictions of the layers as well. And so a kind of good question is, well, how do I go from there, from this you know, digital file that I've produced into an actual physical 3D print? Um, so some people may have their own 3D printers. If you know, if you have that, that's great. You're kind of already an expert. Um, but otherwise, there's kind of two good options to use. So one is uh, using a makerspace. So at Arizona State University, they have a makerspace with lots of 3D printers, um, and they have lots of people there that can also help you figure out how to get things printed correctly. Um, because with your digital file. Um, you have to go through a step where it becomes a cut file, where essentially it's going to slice it up into every single individual layer that's going to be printed. Um, but makerspaces are quite common um, at other universities or libraries, um, and they kind of also have resources that can, you know, help make sure your 3D print comes out good. Um, but the other thing that has been really easy is that there's lots of online printing services. So this, as an example, is one I've used before. This is Craft Cloud. Um, and all you do is you just upload that STL file that you created and you select the type of 3D print that you want. And then you are given tons of options for different companies that can create your 3D print. So there's another one I have here. This was created um, from a third party. And you don't have to have any knowledge of 3D printing. You don't have to have personal access to a 3D printer. As long as you have that digital file, all you have to do is upload it. And then the whatever company you've selected will generate it and ship it to you. And I'll go into next kind of the different types of 3D printing. But overall, you can do ones that are not too big of a cost. Okay, so next I'm going to go over some of the different types of 3D printing and kind of the different implications for how your 3D print ends up looking. So I'm first going to talk about fused depositional modeling or FDM. This is also known as fused filament fabrication, FFF. So this is really the most common and well-known type of 3D printing. And what this does is the 3D printer extrudes uh, thermoplastic filaments. Um, and how it does, it does each individual layer. And you can see on the, the photo of this physical 3D print, it results in visible layer lines that are kind of reminiscent of contour lines on a topographic map. So this is overall the lowest cost and most widely used 3D printing method. For a 3D print that is maybe about, you know, a square that's about 10 to 15 centimeters that typically costs $10 or less if you're using um, a third party printing service. And obviously that's even less if you're able to do it on um, on your own on a 3D printer since that was, you know, the cost of filaments are, are not too high. So this is uh, very reasonable. Uh, and this is the common layer thickness of about 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters. So that's kind of related to how fine of a resolution of the detail can you get, which each of these layers that it's 3D printing is on average 0.2 millimeters. So this is where you're not going to get all of the finest, finest detail. Um, but this can be interesting, and I'll talk about later how this is very reminiscent to kind of contour lines on a map. Another type of 3D printing is called stereolithography or SLA. So this method uses a laser to cure liquid resin into a hardened plastic. 
And as you can see, this is a photo of a 3D print um, with SLA of the Garlock Fault Zone in Ridgecrest, California. And this method can produce really fine features and high detail. So you can kind of really clearly make out the fault trace. You can see a lot of the really detailed features of the landscape. And so this is a very smooth surface that doesn't have the visible layer lines. Um, so let me just kind of quickly, again, kind of layer lines there and this very smooth surface. Um, there are some kind of desktop or, you know, at home printers available using this resin method, um, but it's a significantly higher on demand cost. I'd say the cost of, you know, if you use an online service of producing an SLA print um, is probably about four to five times higher than the kind of thermoplastic uh, FDM type. So this is considerably um, more expensive to produce, but you get a lot more of the fine detail seen in the topography. And so again, this common layer thickness of 0.1 millimeters is finer. So you're, you can have more detail in the 3D print and what you're looking at. Um, and lastly, I'll talk about selective laser sintering or SLS. So this uses a layer to sinter a polymer powder into a solid structure. So what's good about this is it can easily produce uh, designs that have complex geometries. And similar to the SLA resin, this gets a generally smooth surface. Uh, you don't really see those visible layer lines. Here's a kind of, uh, I showed you a digital version of Dragon's Back Ridge, and this is the actual 3D print. You can see quite a lot of the details on the, um, on the landscape. However, this is really more of an industrial 3D printing process. Um, this, again, is uh, quite a bit of a higher cost. Uh, and so just based on kind of what I've printed, I would, if I want something that is kind of really highlighting the topography, I would choose the resin SLA over the, um, the SLS method, which is a little bit more, and you know, works better for kind of industrial types of 3D printing. Um, but again, it's kind of in that 0.1 millimeter layer thickness of that kind of vertical resolution that you can uh, get in your 3D print. Um, and so here now is a really nice side-by-side -side comparison of the two, two of the 3D printing types. Um, so this on the left is an example of that fused depositional modeling. And this is uh, using a PLA filament, kind of a very common type of filament that's melted down. And on the right is showing the SLA resin. So this is a 3D print of the Monte La Salle National Forest in Utah. So this is a really great example. Um, these are faceted spurs. So this is a landscape produced by faulting. And on the FDM model, you can really see those layer lines that essentially read kind of like contour intervals. Whereas on the SLA resin one, you can see a lot more of the kind of actual fine detail. Um, and again, you don't see those layer lines. So the type of 3D printing that you use matters um, in terms of how your end product turns out and what you're kind of interested in using it for, whether a kind of specific you know, educational application or just kind of as like, you know, a really cool hobbyist thing if you could have a 3D print of, you know, any landscape sitting on your desk. And so I then wanted to talk about the kind of educational applications that were interested in 3D printing. So there have been some studies already that kind of uh, seek to evaluate how effective, you know, incorporating 3D prints of landscapes and terrains are in education. Um, so based on pilot studies, there seems to be kind of really good promise in having 3D prints, um, you know, supplement kind of traditional learning methods. And there's lots of different kind of opportunities and applications. Obviously, we're talking about, um, you know, terrestrial topography, um, but you can also extend this to uh, other planets, other planetary surfaces, kind of um, even subsurface within the Earth applications. Um, and the kind of 
greater inclusivity and accessibility where uh, for students who are blind and visually impaired, these 3D prints may be kind of an enhanced alternative to tactile graphics. Um, and just kind of we're really interested in how does, you know, this tactile exploration um, and kind of this spatial understanding improve learning. So kind of thinking about, you know, some of the realms of which this might fit in is a, a very obvious uh, kind of use in helping students learn how to read uh, topographic maps. So up on the top, you can see we have uh, contour maps. So these contour lines, these are two dimensional representations of three dimensional information. And students often struggle with this spatial translation. Um, where the kind of key concept is, you know, the farther apart the lines are, that means, you know, the shallower the slopes um, and kind of the closer they are together, the steeper the topography. But that can be uh, a really difficult concept for kind of students to grasp. And um, it can be really, again, really difficult to have this translation from purely two dimensional information to the 3D. But say you added in a 3D print of that exact same area, that provides a three-dimensional representation. So again, this digital 3D render matches and is what this uh, contour map is. So you can imagine having students work both with contour maps and a corresponding 3D print to better help um, understand how to read contour maps um, and understand contour lines and just really have this kind of help in the spatial translation. And so this is where perhaps that the kind of cheaper, um, less expensive, uh, you know, FDM filament style printing can be beneficial because on those prints, that's where you see the layer lines from the 3D print, which they are not equivalent to, con you know, the exact elevation contours, but they are equal inter intervals. So that can even make a, uh, this kind of spatial understanding even easier. Um, as well, you could do things like you could have 3D prints of different types of volcanoes. So different, you know, each type of volcano has distinct features that are related to their formation mechanism and also the hazards that they pose, you know, such as slope or steepness and their roughness. So students can hold 3D prints in their hands that would, you know, help to complement textbook photos and diagrams. So again, going from something that often is maybe just, you know, a, a 2D image of a volcano or maybe a cross section, uh, students can hold 3D prints in their hands. So again, these are just digital renders, but you can see examples of something that is a shield volcano, this very kind of, uh, you know, diffuse, low slopes, wide area versus a cinder cone, which is kind of steeper, but you can see overall this landscape is pretty smooth versus a strato volcano, which are the big volcanoes and kind of very steep, rugged topography. So having students being able to, you know, explore these features, you know, in three dimension tactily. And then as well, there's also kind of cool potential slightly more niche applications or, you know, ways to learn about faults and tectonics. So this is, uh, again, a digital render of Wallace Creek in California. This is along the San Andreas Fault and it's a kind of classic example of stream offset. So in just kind of this whole uh, just singular 3D print, you know, students can work to see, can you make out where the fault trace is in the 3D print, which the fault runs right about there. Um, and then you can kind of work out what's the motion along the fault. And you can see here, there's this stream that's been offset along the fault. But say we have uh, this 3D print that we've kind of split into two, which we can kind of use other uh, software to this kind of slice our, our 3D print and you could have, you know, on, on the right side and the left side of the fault. And so students can actively kind of move this and you could line up again where the stream originally was. And there's an even older offset. And so this is kind of a really cool, again, another 
purely kind of tactile way to explore kind of fault motion and understand these offsets. So this is just kind of, you know, thinking about, you know, all the potential uses um, within the classroom. Um, and so there's, I've talked kind of exclusively about, you know, bare earth topography, but you can absolutely create 3D prints of built structures and environments. Um, so since we host uh, the state of Indiana's LIDAR data, the Indiana School for the Blind and Visually Impaired has a 3D print of their whole campus. Um, and so again, this is something that's great to be able to tactile, tactile explore the whole landscape. And as you can see in this, this is a pretty large print, but it's uh, composed of smaller pieces. So essentially, if you want a very large print, um, you create smaller prints and piece them together like a puzzle. Um, but again, here's kind of, this is a kind of good example of uh, looking at a built environment. Um, and then just some other examples um, kind of from using OT resources, um, looking at a local headwater catchment and kind of as related to hydrology. So this is also really cool. Say you're taking a group of students out into the field, you can create a 3D print of the exact area that you're going to. Uh, also related to hydrology, you could have a 3D print of a watershed and have students kind of help figure out um, how to delineate the catchment. Um, and again, this is kind of a little bit on the right, a little bit more of a hobbyist application, you know, 3D print of your hometown. And so this is another kind of more built environment. Um, and, you know, you can create 3D prints of places that are kind of near and dear to you. And if you'd like to get any kind of ready to print files on our open landform catalog, which we discussed in the last webinar on educational resources. Uh, there are a number of landforms that have ready to download STL files for 3D printing. So you can just click to download. Um, and this is available for most all landforms that kind of look interesting in a 3D print. So this is something that you could send off to a 3D printer and have made, and you don't have to create the file yourself. And uh, again, we have a full page, uh, opentopography.org slash learn slash 3D printing that, again, kind of has a link to our tutorial and uh, kind of recap overview of all of this information um, if you're interested in diving into the world of 3D printing. Okay, so now that we've kind of uh, covered the realm of 3D printing. We're going to shift now into the second topic of iPhone LiDAR. So there are multiple different scales of LiDAR. When we think about LiDAR, oftentimes we think about this airborne LiDAR laser scanners that are attached to aircraft. And this is what's collecting these large swaths of topography data. Most of the topography that you find on open topography but there is also terrestrial laser scanning, doing kind of uh, more ground-based LIDAR and capturing. Uh, they can also mount LIDAR to cars. But now we're in, we have the option of the very smallest scale of LIDAR, it, which is handheld uh, right in your phones. And so you can also imagine kind of the difference in the type of the things that you would want to scan from, you know, a whole landscape to maybe a kind of more specific area or cliff face versus handheld, um, maybe a kind of smaller scale cliff face or um, a boulder. But we can we can now have the power of LIDAR um, held directly in our hands and within our own pockets. So iPhones um, now have a built-in LIDAR scanner on the newest Apple products. So if you have a new iPhone, Along with where the cameras are, this little kind of uh, gray-black circle in the bottom, that is what is the LiDAR scanner. So this is available on iPhones 12, 13, and 14 Pro and Pro Max, along with the iPad Pro. So it has to be a Pro version, which means you have that kind of three camera, camera configuration. And uh, it's, again, if you have an iPhone 12, 13, or 14 Pro, you have the power of LiDAR uh, right in your cell phone. 
And so you can use iPhone LiDAR to create 3D representations of close range objects. So typically we think of the range of iPhone LiDAR as up to about five meters away. Um, so again, it's kind of much closer and finer scale than what you get from uh, TLS or terrestrial laser scanning. All right, so how do you go about using iPhone LiDAR and harnessing its power? Um, there are a variety of free apps that are available on the Apple App Store. So I just listed a few names here. There's the 3D Scanner app, Polycam, Magic Plan, Scanniverse. Um, so if you kind of search light, you know, iPhone LiDAR or any of these names, these will come up. There's also kind of blog posts online that collate all of the different apps that you can use. And uh, many of these apps combine LiDAR and photogrammetry. So you end up with a point cloud and a surface color. Um, and again, photogrammetry is where you can take photographs from around multiple angles of an object and kind of stitch them together. And some of these apps, even if you don't have the LiDAR capabilities, you, could, you can still use just photogrammetry. Um, and so this is kind of your, if you're looking to use, you know, app specific, but then there's also kind of some, we'll call them regular or fun apps. Apps like Snapchat actually use iPhone LiDAR for augmented reality filters. So you can see it's kind of using LiDAR to scan the space to know where to place these, um, you know, augmented reality filters. Um, and a number of these apps, you can also use augmented reality in them to kind of place your scan in different environments. So I'm gonna go through a little walkthrough of the process of doing a scan with the iPhone LiDAR. Um, an app that I've used before um, and I'm familiar with is, uh, it's called the 3D Scanner app. So again, kind of that's free within the Apple App Store. And the first thing is you obviously wanna choose an object to scan. So I've chosen this nice rock in front of my house. Um, so something that is kind of like, you know, a rock or a cliff face or kind of, um, we'll call it a more solid object is good to scan. As you can see in the background, there is a bush. And if you're trying to do bushes or vegetation, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult just because of so much of the fine detail with all the leaves. But I'm, I've chosen this rock that I want to scan with my iPhone. So when you open the app, you can start the scan. Essentially what you want to do is move your de device around the full extent of the object. Um, and so this is showing a preview that has a textured mesh overlay. You can see kind of how the mesh fits on there. And the areas that are these green dots have not yet been scanned. So this gives you a good idea of where you kind of still have to move or maybe adjust the angle to scan properly. Uh, and so this is a feature that's really easy to scan just by me holding the phone and walking around it. But, um, you know, say you have like a huge volcanic bomb in the field, you kind of really you don't want to scan. Um, if you have a selfie stick, you can use that to really extend the reach. Um, or even if you're kind of doing a small cliff face, you know, having a, an extendable selfie stick will really help with the range and making sure you can kind of scan uh, the feature in whole. But once you've gone uh, and kind of scanned everything, um, you can, you know, then process this scan. So the app typically will output a, a rough texture map first, and you can choose kind of how high resolution of detail you want to process. So this is showing the kind of full processed scan. Um, and as you can see, I've, I focused on the rock, so the rock looks great, um, but there's some kind of wonky residual areas that aren't well scanned that I'm not interested in, um, but you, we're kind of, you can further go in and refine this. Um, but so you can see this kind of spatial extent of this scan. Um, and on my phone, it only took about a minute to process. So this is not taking long um, processing times or kind of much, you know, work power to do. Um, and this particular scan also captured 244 photogrammetry images. So again, this is where it's combining the LIDAR with um, the photogrammetry for that kind of full um, visual overlay. 
Um, and again, like I mentioned, because there's kind of areas that I'm not interested in that kind of half scanned, you can also even within the app kind of crop and uh, edit your scan as needed. Um, you can also do some analyses within the apps, uh, such as taking measurements. Um, so this is kind of really cool that you can just kind of, you know, touch the two, you know, endpoints that you're interested in, um, and it can tell you exactly uh, the dimensions of it. So again, that's a really cool, you know, application if you're kind of looking to do stuff kind of quickly within the field. Um, and then there are lots of different file types that you can export this scan. Um, since obviously you can do a little bit within the app, but there's a lot more you can do if you export it. So um, of the different file types, um, you can do a floor plan image since a lot of the apps um, also focus on kind of utility of scanning uh, rooms and buildings kind of related to design or architecture. Um, there's an OBJ file is kind of the most common or standard uh, file type for just kind of uh, this three, we'll call it just a 3D model, um, and that you can kind of open it and just, you know, in free software, view it on your computer. Um, as I talked about in the first half, these STL files, you could export this um, as an STL file for use in 3D printing. You can export as a point cloud. Um, or you could export all the data, including all the captured images um, from the photogrammetry. Um, and what's great about this in particular is within your point cloud export options, um, within this app, you have the option to export a georeferenced LAS file. So LAS is kind of one of your most standard common point cloud file types. And uh, you have the option to export it geo-referenced. So this should be under WGS84. Um, and this obviously is using geo-referencing capabilities within the iPhone and the precision that comes with that. Um, so the other option um, is to use targets um, and kind of how you add you know, targets if you're doing maybe um, you know, a drone-based survey to kind of help the resolution of your georeferencing, um, but otherwise, you, if you kind of need just you know good enough georeferencing, um, 3D Scanner app and some of the other apps do give you the option to export that georeferenced point cloud, um, which again is super cool if you want to do um, further analyses. Um, so you could, you know, explore your 3D scan. This is just opening the OBJ file on my computer. Um, and so you can see this is without any cropping or editing, um, but just spinning it around. Um, but again, the, the great thing is that you can open these point clouds, you know, and especially your georeferenced point cloud in Cloud Compare. So we had in earlier webinar talking about um, 3D visualizations of topography data. Um, and part of that was talking about cloud compare. So you can go back to that webinar and more, learn more about the capabilities and features of cloud compare. But you can see I've exported the scan from my phone. Um, and now I can, you know, explore and, you know, fine tune and analyze this point cloud within the cloud compare software. So this is where, again, it might be a little easier. I can, you know, trim down uh, my file. I can continue to do further measurements, um, other analyses. Um, and, you know, again, the kind of software you, you look at, you know, other types of point clouds, you can look at um, what your iPhone has been able to measure. And so already there has been some explorations of applications of iPhone LiDAR in the geosciences. So kind of looking at the this article about evaluating it, uh, primarily used it for scanning small cliff faces. Um, and then, you know, another article kind of looking at the smartphone uh, assisted field work, um, where again, a lot of people have phones. This is super small, handheld in your pocket. Um, and, you know, we can use these features um, and kind of have it be, you know, a great either, you know, a quick and easy starting point or, you know, good exploration for um, 
students without having to use kind of full grade, um, you know, terrestrial laser scanning equipment. Um, so then thinking about how, how does the iPhone LiDAR compare? Um, so this table kind of, you know, we're looking at uh, some of the different scales. So, uh, you know, mobile LiDAR with the iPhone versus, you know, more of terrestrial laser scanning or airborne LiDAR, um, and then also photogrammetry. So thinking about uh, would you use your iPhone LiDAR versus actually doing a full drone survey? So obviously phones are very, very accessible and they're very easy to use. You know, in doing the scan, all you do, you just move the phone, uh, you know, around your whole object to make sure you kind of have captured that all in a scan. And there's not really any learning curve as long as you can kind of move it, you know how to use phone apps. Um, there's kind of no uh, other setup. You know, comparatively, it's also relatively low cost. Now, these iPhone Pro models, they're not cheap by any means. Um, they'll typically start at at least $1,000, but, you know, they are um, much more inexpensive and more accessible compared to, um, you know, some of the really nice drones or, you know, other TLS software. Obviously, very highly portable, you know, hold it in your phone. Um, but, Obviously, then you're going to have some sacrifices in terms of the accuracy um, and the image fidelity. So the two previous papers um, I showed, you know, do kind of look at and compare accuracy of the iPhone LiDAR compared to, say, you know, actually using, you know, TLS to scan a cliff face. Um, and, you know, obviously the, you know, more professional grade, you know, TLS is going to be better. And, you know, if you, you know, really want to do good structure from motion, you know, you probably want to do, you know, use drones for your photogrammetry. But overall, it's still, you know, not bad, you know, especially if this can be a tool that students can use, um, you know scan it quickly and then you again you can export them look at them in cloud compare um, this could also be good for kind of you know preliminary evaluations um, or say you're in the field and you see something and you don't have all your equipment on them you know you do a scan and kind of evaluate it um, so obviously this is where you know you know iphones really increase the accessibility and ease of lidar it obviously is not going to be you know as accurate um, you know, if you're really wanting to, you know, use something that you would use a TLS application for, um, but it's kind of in this perfect realm, I think, both for kind of hobbyists and students and, uh, you know, introductory explorations that are low cost without having to really uh, invest in other materials and software. And so with that, that kind of covers the, the broad range of uh, 3D printing uh, and to iPhone LiDAR. So uh, at this point, I think we'll be able to take any questions live if there are any. Great, thanks Emily. So there was one question in the chat, which I held out to answer, let you answer it live, which was how do you deal with holes in the DEM? So for example, you showed the Oxbow River and Trench Meander example. And like in that case, you might have roof turns off the water or no returns off the water. And so you may have holes. So can you talk a little bit about how you make your model, like, you know, essentially watertight? Yes. So I don't have an example on me, but there is one I 3D printed um, that did have a small hole in the DEM. And obviously that area is going to end up being whatever is kind of the lowest printed area. So if you do have holes in your DEM, they will end up as holes in your 3D print. So before you go to creating your STL file, um, I found there should be tutorials online for trying to interpolate that area of your DEM. Um, so essentially, you, you want to try and do some, some type of interpolation uh, to be able to fill the holes in your DEM. Um, it's best to do that again with a DEM versus trying to fix, say, a hole that, you know, or a low spot that is in the generated, you know, 3D printable file. Um, so there should be there should be kind of walkthroughs online for, you know, how do I patch a hole um, and interpolate a DEM. 
Yeah, and I just, I just, if you're making a DM with open topography, for example, you can, um, under the triangulation tool, the tin-based gridding tool, you can actually control the length of the triangles that are basically used to mesh the data before the grid is sampled. And so you could, if you're using open topography, you could play with different triangle lengths to basically make, to try to address some of those issues. Um, and then the local gridding tool in open topography, if you've been watching all the webinars, we talked about these tools in previous webinars, but that also has a, a fill nulls function, which is basically a moving window that marches over the, the grid and attempts to use uh, cells that are adjacent to empty cells to, to fill the grid. So you could play with, there's like a three by three, a five by five and a seven by seven moving window option. And so you could also play with that. Any other I, questions from folks? Ramon, do you look like you might have a question you want to ask? Yeah, I was going to ask Emily um, about uh, painting the 3D prints. I had seen early on some examples, like someone made a 3D model of their cat that was black and white, and then they the it was like came the model had black and white uh, color on the surface. So, uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, of course, we're talking about you know Earth science, maybe color of a geologic map or or imagery on a 3D print, for example. Yeah. So I haven't gotten as deep into kind of software like. Blender or um, other tools where you can really slice up your model um, and assign different filament print colors to that. So that's kind of one option. All of these landscapes are just using a kind of solid, uh, you know, one color. But you, if you have something that has either kind of, you know, discrete layers or something you can assign directly, I'm going to print this in different colors. Um, but you can absolutely also, you might have to condition them with some kind of sanding or primer, but just literally paint on them. So we've seen some applications where, you know, you could give, you know, students a print and maybe they then paint on the geologic map. Um, but again, depending on the, the material that it's used, um, you might just have to kind of do some kind of sanding or conditioning or specific paint um, so that, you know, it doesn't kind of chip off. Well, anybody else have anything? Feel free to throw them in the in the Q and A section, and we'll answer. Um, we've also I also put links to both the um, three D printing page that Emily referenced earlier, um, which has a lot of resources that Emily went over, um, and then also her, the blog post she wrote about iPhone lidar. So if you want resources, check out the chat for those. Emily. How long do you think it would take me to start essentially from square one um, with moderate GIS skills to be able to have the file sent off for the 3D printing? Um, if you kind of, you know, have familiarity and having used GIS before, you know, I'd say no more than five to 10 minutes. Because part of it might be, you know, I've tested, you know, this dimension or I've tested, you know, you know, a certain base height. And, uh, you know, uh, you might have to do a little fine tuning and kind of what you want for your landscape. But otherwise, it's simply kind of, you know, drawing a kind of area around the exact space you want 3D printed, how big you want the print. Maybe you got to adjust vertical exaggeration. Again, the base height. Um, but it really only takes a few seconds for it to, you know, when you click it to generate that printable file. Um, so there's really like, it's, um, it's very accessible, you know, even if you're, not, you don't, you don't, you absolutely do not have to be a GIS, uh, you know, or Blender 3D print, you know, 3D file expert by any means. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. There's still a bunch of people hanging out though. So <laughs> feel free to, to toss a question in there. Otherwise we're at 10 till the hours so we can we could wrap up here shortly if we don't see anything else. Uh, I have, I was just gonna add one thing uh, actually, and maybe Chris, you'll have to, I'll put it in here to the this chat, but you may have to send it out more broadly. Um, sure. But there was, there's a, a really nice blog post by Ian Pierce about uh, using kind of a combination of iPhone LiDAR and uh, structure for motion photogrammetry to make uh, outcrop models for excavations. 
and but this could you know also be for other outcrops that were be accessible and what i found was interesting about this is that the the combination of you know you know basically the iphone lidar gives a really good geometric representation of the wall and is adequate for some uh logging and mapping but the um the structure for motion gave actually even better texture map but it had a warp to it and so the combination of the two allowed ian uh and and as he describes in that tutorial to use the iphone lighter to basically take away the warp that's in the photogrammetry this is a very interesting um application and a really nice uh, blog post great and i put that into the chat to everyone so hopefully people can see that as well um since seeing no more questions, I guess we should wrap up. Um, so maybe, Emily, if you could go back one, yeah, there. <laughs> so thank you all. For those of you that made it to all eight um, webinars, we're impressed and <laughs> hopefully you found them useful. Um, but they're all online, so feel free to share with your colleagues um, or revisit if you missed some. And then I think the other thing we're going to do here probably in the next few days is send out a little survey, ask for your feedback on um, these webinars, and if you found them useful, if there are things you'd like to see us do in the future, this was a little bit of an experiment. So we uh, may likely do this again in the future. I'm not sure exactly when, but but we'll um, we'll do that. Somebody asked for a link to that page, so we can find that. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can quickly do that. Um, but when you see that uh, message from us, please um, do do respond if you can give us feedback. Um, here is the link to, so this is the link to the page that has all the webinars in a table. There's also a section inside of open topography under learn. Let me see if I can quickly find that. Where did you put those, Emily? Webinar archive. There it is. <laughs> so they're actually, you can find them in two places. So there's um, put that out there as well. So there's a list of webinars. It has this set of webinars, but actually some other, we've done other webinars in the past, not a series, but kind of one-offs. And so those are all listed on that page. And then the other previous link is the link to the, the page about this specific series. So um, thank you for coming everybody. And I guess we'll call it a wrap.